Hey, welcome back to the Positive Side Podcast. Glad you are tuning in. The, the Wednesday interview series continues, and today is going to be one of my favorite guests of all time. I'm going to bring him in here in just a second. But uh, real quick, if you haven't ran over to jeremytodd.com and grabbed that new book that I just, it's just been out for a few weeks now, of The Positive Side of How I Overcame Bullying, Bankruptcy, and a Bad Attitude to Actually Discover Who I Truly Am. And you know, we go in, in that book, we talk about a lot of things with mindset and all the struggles that I went through with the uh, you know, the, the utilities getting shut off and obviously found bankruptcy and just uh, just a bad attitude. And uh, but run over there and grab that book if you haven't. I really appreciate that. But more importantly, today, uh, speaking of mindset, one of my favorite guests of all time, third time on it, Dave Anderson. Welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Jeremy. One of my favorite books by far, and I've got it right here in my hand, Unstoppable. And this book really has changed my life in so many ways. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, uh, The Game Changer Life. That gets me jacked up every time I listen to it. I listen to the episode, then I listen to the uh, the Friday morning, just short two, three minute episode. Um, I guess real quick, um, before I get too far into the weeds, but um, why did you start the podcast? How did you start the podcast? And what does that mean to you? Because I'm a huge podcast fan. We started the podcast about six months before the book came out, four to six months before the book came out. We just wanted to start to throw the material out there, get ready get people ready for the book. And we wanted to reach people the book wouldn't reach. I mean, the, uh, the book has done well, but the podcast now is downloaded in I think 140 plus countries. And so we wanted to, to, to broaden the message and the podcast really gave us a great chance to do it. It also reinforces the message of the book. So, you know, we need reinforcement so people can read it, but then they hear different aspects of it. They hear it go a little deeper in certain areas. So we really looked at it as a good one, two punch. I love it. I share it. Uh, I share the podcast all the time. I, sh- I share it to the, you know, I'm in the car business. I work at a big dealer group called Kelly Automotive, which, you know, again, quick plug for them. I think it's the best dealer group in the world. I mean, where else in the car dealership do I get today off, tomorrow off and Christmas off and the work Saturday right. I'm off Sunday? I mean, that doesn't happen in the auto industry. So I'm very, very blessed, but I share the episode all the time, but it, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on today was um, obviously 2020 was been it's been kind of wild, uh, ups and downs. Business has been ups and down, and, and and typically I don't prepare for a lot of my interviews, but these questions are very very important. I wanted to make sure I didn't forget them. Uh, it's, obviously, 2020 is almost over. How do we recover? If you're out there, if, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're in business, if you're in any kind of industry, how do you recover from a year like 2020? Well, you should have already started. Really, I mean, you know, you can't. Uh... You can't wait for the new year to have started. Hopefully, you started putting things in place back in March. Uh, I, I see a lot of people that that they've really, well, it hasn't been fun, and we've gone through a lot. They have found ways to benefit from it, and coming up with new services, uh, being coming more capable, uh, becoming more unified, and we we start benefiting from adversity when we realize it's an opportunity. And we can either let it happen to us or we can make it happen for us. And one of the things I talked about in my podcast early on, I think it was probably back in March or early April, is you really have that option. You can let this happen to you because there's a lot of stuff that has gone on this year that's beyond our control. Government mandates, you know, shutdowns and so forth. We can't control that. And if you if that's all you're focusing on, you're you're going to be ultimately stressed out and you become immobilized. Because if you're focused on things you can't do anything about, you don't do anything at all. And, and so we've got to find ways, how can I use this? How can I get stronger, wiser, better because of it? In our own company, I mean, we, yeah, we took a hit. Uh, probably 75% of our revenue is from live speaking events. And when 75% of your revenue is from live speaking events and 99% of the events get canceled, you better figure stuff out. You can't wait. And so we were able to come up with seven new different services that weren't even on the table before the whole COVID stuff started. And so, you know, if you're waiting until now to figure out how can I benefit, you're late. Hopefully you started planting seeds, putting things in place, streamlining, getting more in a niche. You know, what can we really excel at now? Coming up with a broader array of services to when things start to get back to the way they used to be, and it'll be slow. Yeah. You'll have whatever used to be plus the new things you've come up with. And that's when you take that that giant leap forward. You know, Jeremy, I say a lot, not, not every season is a harvest. 
And, and for many of us, this season has not been a harvest. But during that drought, if you're planting and weeding and seeding and feeding, the harvest is going to come. If, if during the drought, you're just complaining and sucking your thumb and acting like a victim and talking about how unfair it all is, then that drought's going to be a lot longer for you. There's no question about it. And I love how you talk about the seasons all the time. And I, I try and... You know, I'm not nearly as eloquent a speaker as you are because I try to talk about the, the seasons. They're so important to me as well. It's the harvest seed, it's the planting season. And I think you're exactly right. When you talk about, you know, uh, as, as crazy as it has been for 2020, for me, I've looked at it as a huge opportunity. And man, I, I what you're saying is, you know, and, and I can't agree more that this is all going to add to the business. So it's almost like a rocket ship. Hey, I was going good. Things were great. But now I've got this whole new set of businesses that are all lined up. And when it all comes together, it's going to take off like a rocket ship. And that's the exciting part about 2021. In the in the book, in, the, in your book, Unstoppable, and this is what I, I, I some questions I want to get into as well. Um, you talk about the, the four d different types of characters and the, the two bottom ones I want to talk about briefly, but let me back up a second. The caretaker and the undertaker are by far the two bottom ones. And what I'm curious about as a leader going coming out of a crisis, how do you manage the two bottom? And again, I don't I use bottom with respect. I mean, they are. I'm not trying to say they're bad people or anything, but how would you manage and lead those guys through a crisis? You know, leading those people through any time is is difficult and challenging. The undertaker, just for those who aren't aware, uh, the undertaker is the person on a team that doesn't even do baseline work. They don't even do what they're required to do. That's why we call them undertakers. They take under production, morale, momentum, the brand, your credibility. The caretaker, and I think this is the biggest group in a lot of organizations, they at least do what is required. However, they tend to think it's heroic, all right? <laughs> I did my job. They pledge allegiance to the job description. They don't take initiative. They don't solve problems. They don't look to help anybody else. They dot the I's, cross the T's. And so in any time, we, we, need to, we, we either need to get the undertakers better or we need to get them gone. I should also add there is a second version of the undertaker. There's the person who doesn't even do baseline work, but there's also the person... Jeremy, at the other end of the spectrum, it could be a top performer, could be the top person on the team that's toxic, yeah. that's negative, that's divisive, that's selfish, that's always creating the drama that holds the meeting after the meeting. I, I honestly believe this person is more devastating than the first version. This person creates more distractions, holds more good people down. Uh, this person hurts your credibility if you're in a leadership position even more. So we need to either get those people turned around or we need to remove them because we cannot continue in business with either of those two categories for long and reach our potential. Uh, the caretaker, there's hope for the caretaker. Okay, the caretaker, a lot of them don't understand uh, the, the benefits of stretching a little bit, of taking initiative, and, and often rather than stretch that person to a level that we expect from them, we drop the level to accommodate them. We drop the bar to accommodate their comfort zone. So one of the things we can do uh, to bring caretakers up to another level, it happens gradually. And I talk about this in my new book that's coming out in April, uh, Intentional Mindset, is we, what we call raise your basis. We gradually raise your basis. Your basis, let me explain this, take a couple minutes, but your basis is whatever daily routine you have, you pretty well mastered it, and it's gotten you to the point to where you're at. It's not a bad thing. It's just something that over time, I can do it. I do it pretty much every time. I'm comfortable with it. The problem is if we let people do what they're comfortable with, Jeremy, they don't grow. They right. stay the same. So as a manager, to manage that person, to address your question, it's, it's gradually raising their basis in certain areas to where they are going to have to learn something, become more consistent, become better at something to hit that new basis. It's not dropping the bar to accommodate them, it's equipping them to reach the bar. So if you have someone in sales and their basis, I'll just pick an easy number, 
we'll work with easy numbers here. Please, their please, basis please. is making 10 quality phone calls a day. Let's say that's their basis. And let's say the caretaker does it. They do it consistently. They do a decent job. Now the playmaker's doing 15 and the game changer's doing 25, but, this per but, but the minimum is 10. And this person, they're gonna take that 10, they're gonna drag it out through the whole day, but they will make that 10th call before they go home that day. The undertaker's not even doing that. They're either lying about it or making you think they've done it, or they're giving you an excuse for why it didn't happen, why they've got seven. Yeah. So what we wanna do is when we're raising a basis, we wanna focus on activities, not outcomes. Too often we focus on raising the outcome without raising the activity, but the activities create the outcomes. Yeah. So if you want greater outcomes, we've got to do a better job of managing the activities that are most predictive of taking them there. So we're going to say, and this is how I like to do it. I like, I like to get their buy-in. I would say something to the effect that this, you know, you're doing a great job with these 10 calls. You do, you, you do them consistently. Do you think over the course of a day, Jeremy, have you got two more quality calls in you? Sure. The course of the day. No one's going to say no to that. They're going to say exactly what you said. Sure. <sighs> They'd be embarrassed to say, no, I can't do two more calls today. <laughs> well, what they've just agreed to do is raise their basis by what percent? 20%. 20 percent. Yeah. 20%. It's not intimidating. It's realistic. We're not going from 10 to 20. And, and so, and they're bought into it. They say, yeah, I can do it. We're not dictating it to them. And, and so what we're doing is we're, we're looking for their key activities that they're engaging in throughout the day. And we're gradually raising that basis over time and getting them to an entirely different level. They don't even realize what's happening. Their outcomes start to change because their productive activities are changing. And that's how we can help that person. You're not going to get the caretaker to another level by hugging them, burping them, bribing them, giving them pep talks. You probably tried all that stuff. Oh yeah. Trying to get them to do it for the team. But by taking a more logical approach, just like we kind of role played here, you can start to increase the level of their productive activities, which will translate to greater results. The next two people we talk about is the, the playmaker and the game changer. And, and I'm always curious, and, and this is, you know, I, I consider myself a game changer. I, I'm, you know, we're all not game changers. And we talked about this before in the past. We're not all game changers all the time. Right. And I try and be. I mean, that's a bar that I'm always trying to shoot for and trying to be the best version I can. As a playmaker, coming and again, I, I keep using this crisis as as an example because I think it's a, it's again we talk about it's a gigantic opportunity to get to the next level. So as a playmaker, to get to the game changer in this new, you know, the new normal, quote unquote, what do we do as a playmaker to get to the next level level as a game changer? You know, I you you've got a the the key difference between and again to go back to what you said, you made a really good point. I mentioned in the book that very often we can be a blend of these four groups from time to time, depending on what's going on in our life. You know, even what time of the month it is can depend uh, if sure. you're in the sales profession, but there's one that dominates. So if the playmaker mindset is what's dominating you and the playmaker is close to that game changer level, but let me tell you, the key thing that's missing is consistency. The playmaker does a lot of what the game changer does. The game changer just does it more consistently. So what that, now there's a reason that that playmaker, there may be several, but there's a core reason that playmaker isn't as consistent as the game changer. There's not something they want bad enough in their life that strips away the option of not being consistent. See, if there's not something you want in your life bad enough to where you just don't give yourself the option not to do it, it's the right thing to do, I've got to do it, then, then you will make the wrong choice very often. The game changer very often, most of the time has a bigger, what I call why, a bigger why, bigger reasons for doing what they do. And because their reasons are bigger, they're more consistent because the stakes are so high, they can't not do it. And so we can say, yeah, well, the big difference between the playmaker and the game changer is consistency. True, but let's dig deeper. Why is that? The playmaker doesn't have a big enough why. It's not compelling enough. It's not deep enough to, to give themselves no option not to do the right thing. Once they figure out what that is, and it's different for all of us, we all have different reasons why we get up every morning and why anybody should care that we get up every morning. That's really the two key questions the why has to answer. Why do you get up today? 
and why should anybody care that you got up today? And if you don't, in other words, what do you want for yourself and who's counting on you to come through? If you don't have really clear, bold, compelling answers for that, you're going to be inconsistent a lot because you're going to give the, you're going to give yourself the option not to do what you know you should be doing because you don't have reasons big enough to do it. Exactly. I'm trying to think of, of another counter question to ask that, but you absolutely nailed it. One of the things I wanted, want you to talk about, and this goes along with exactly the playmaker game changer, is accountability. Um, accountability for me and what I do, I, I always say it over and over, and my, my team gets tired of me saying it. No one likes accountability. No one likes it, but you got to have it. You got to have accountability. And I think that's one of the major things that separates the playmaker from the game changer is you know, sometimes the, the playmaker is good at all these things and they're always going to be there, but that accountability just gets them that one extra level. Um, and, 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 you know, I hear people say, Hey, I like accountability, but when you call them out on the accountability, it's not the most pleasant thing in the world. Well, yeah, I know I'll get to it. I'm going to get to it, yeah. but talk about a little bit about accountability because that is, is rings so true in, in, in your book and in, and in life and in so many areas, but I want to use this as a sales meeting. I'm going to, re, I'm going to, we're going to watch this as a team and I'm hoping to watch it for the whole company, but talk a little bit about uh, accountability. Let, let's start with the game changer. The fact is the game changer doesn't require external accountability nearly as often as the other groups. They hold themselves accountable. They have a higher standard for themselves than anybody else could possibly have for them. Right? And, and so I'm going to talk about the four levels of accountability in a minute. The, the playmaker is not quite to that point yet. Again, it goes back uh, to the why. They're not holding themselves accountable enough because they don't have something in their life that's meaningful enough to hold themselves accountable for. Now, if that's self-accountability, if we are holding someone accountable, here's how we can get better at it. Okay, if you're in a leadership position, you got to change the way you look at it. A, a lot of people, they look at accountability. If I'm a manager, I'm looking at accountability as something I do to someone. Well, if you're, if you're looking at accountability that way, you're going to be reluctant to do it because if it's something you're doing to someone, you're going to feel bad about it. You're going to probably apologize for it. I see managers sit down with somebody and say, Jeremy, I hate to do this, but, and when you <laughs> open up the conversation, with those words, you've immediately dug a hole for yourself. Because when you say, I hate to have to do this, you've immediately made you the bad guy and them the victim. And so they're sitting there like this, like, what are you going to do to me? And so personally, I don't hate to have to do it. I hate that you created a situation to where it's necessary to have this conversation. Sure. I'm going to leave it on them. So we have to change the way we look at it. You're not doing accountability to someone. You're doing it for someone. Yeah. If you keep looking at it as something you're doing to them, you'll always feel bad, you'll be reluctant, you'll be too slow to get there, and you'll apologize. But if you really care about people, if you don't want them to self-destruct, if you want them to be able to take care of their family, if you want them to, to be all they were created to be, then you will realize that you're doing this for them, that you care enough about them to confront them and to have a conversation with them that's going to make you and them uncomfortable, that you're willing to let them be ticked off at you for a while if they need to be to help get them on the right track. You care about them that much. And when you start to look at it that way, you're quicker to do it. Now, if you do it the wrong way, if you're abusive, if you get personal, if you swear at people, if you can't control your emotions, then that just screws it all up. Then you are doing it to them because nobody deserves that nonsense and yeah. that totally distracts from the message. So another, another helpful thing with accountability is just have a conversation with somebody. Accountability should be a conversation. Don't whip out your big, bad, higher than thou accountability voice. We need to talk. Stay away from that nonsense. That's hard to listen to. Have a conversation. Conversations come across as more sincere more compassionate, they're easier to listen to, they're less threatening. If you have trouble controlling your emotions as a leader, you're gonna to have to work on that. Because let me tell you, you can, you can be 100% right with the message you're trying to get across, but if you get it across the wrong way, none of it's gonna matter. Because the person can't get past you and your obnoxious offensive behavior to even hear what you're saying. 
And so you're going to have to work at controlling your emotions. And so it's a skill set, Jeremy. Holding people accountable requires the right skill set and the right mindset. You got to know how to do it. And you also, that's the skill set part. And the mindset is you got to make yourself do it even when you don't feel like doing it. Oh, Maybe yeah. they're your best friend. Maybe they're your family member. Maybe you're worried about, I don't know how they're going to take it. Let me, let me take some pressure off of you. You're not responsible for how they take it. You're not, how respo- you're not responsible for how they respond to it. You're responsible for doing your job. And in a leadership position, holding people accountable is not an option. It's a duty. And if you can't do it, then you need to get out of leadership and go find something you can do. Because this comes with the territory. It's yeah. that big of a deal. You have to look at what's at stake when you don't hold people accountable. Everything's at stake. The team morale is at stake. When you have one person that's not held accountable, the rest of the team morale goes down. Morale is at stake. Momentum is at stake. The culture, the brand, your credibility, results, that's all at stake. You can't pick and choose if you're going to do it or not. You've got to do it, but you got to do it the right way. So by changing the way we look at it, that's the mindset part. I'm doing it for you. Just like if you're raising your kids, you're raising, you care about them. You don't hold them accountable because you despise them because you want something bad to happen to them. It's the opposite. You hold them accountable because you love them Yeah. because you want better for them. They, they may not look at it that way, but that's not on you. That's on them. You can't control how they look at it. You got to do it again the right way. So you change the way you look at it. I'm doing this for you. But then you have to also have the skill set. Do it the right way. Use the right words. Use the right tone. Do it in the right place. We don't humiliate people. The whole, the, the objective of accountability, one, one objective, improve performance. It's not to humiliate. It's not to embarrass. It's not to put someone in their place. It, it's not to remind them that, that, that you're the boss and they're not. You got to get away from that old school garbage. The sole objective of accountability, the sole objective of a consequence is to improve performance. Don't lose sight of that objective. And so work on the skill set and the mindset. And ultimately, when people start to grow, when they start to get up to that playmaker status, they, they, they get to what I call level one accountability, which is where they're holding themselves accountable. So let me give you the four levels. This is a good thing to evaluate for your listeners. I love it. I'm going to give you four levels of accountability. And as I describe them, I want you to think about whatever entity you work in most of the time, whether it's a department, a business, a, a particular location. And what you're going to find is there's probably a blend of the four levels, but one dominates. Okay, there's one, and we want to make sure the right one dominates. So let's talk about level four. Level four is the worst level. The more level four you have, the worse things are going to be. Level four is strictly what I call no accountability. Somebody does the wrong thing, nothing happens. Uh, giving somebody comes in late, nothing happens. They come in late again, nothing happens. They miss a deadline, nothing happens. They don't make the 10 calls, nothing happens. People say, well, is it really realistic to think there's level four accountability? Oh my gosh, there's more level four <laughs> accountability going on right now than I've ever seen. Yeah. To where we think we have standards, but all we really have are suggestions because they don't do it, nothing happens. So we can't call Very it a clear. standard, it's just a suggestion. So the more level four you have, the worse it's going to be morale, momentum, your credibility, the whole bit. So we got to clean that up. You're always going to have a little bit because you can't be everywhere and see everything, but we need to minimize it. One step up from that is level three. Now, level three is it's a good level. It needs to happen. I don't call it level three because it's bad. I call it level three because there's two levels better than it, okay? <laughs> but level three is top down. All right. So top, this is where the leader handles it. Now this is needs to happen. This is the leader's job. There are two levels better than this, but this is the leader's job. So if you're working in a service department in a dealership, if uh, a technician comes in late or a, an advisor comes in late, the manager handles it. It has to happen. If you don't, you have level four. It has to happen. That's that comes with the territory. Remember this with accountability, what you tolerate will continue. So if you tolerate it, don't don't be surprised when you see more of it. What you permit will persist. What you permit, you promote. You think, well, I would never promote tardiness. Well, by permitting it, you are. And so level three is a step forward. Let's talk about a better level. Level two. 
So now level two is what I call peer to peer. So level four is no accountability. Level three is top down. Level two is peer to peer, P-E-E-R. A peer is an equal. It's an equal. A salesperson holding other salesperson accountable. A manager calling out another manager. If you're on a basketball team, I work with the basketball team right now. Uh, you, you've got a, a player. They're not the boss, but they're calling out another player. Hey, man, that's not how we do it here. And so now with level two, that technician comes in late. Who addresses it? Who's the first to address it? It's another technician. And they don't have to be a jerk about it. It's just, it could be something as simple as, hey, man, you got to be here on time with the rest of us. We've been, we've been carrying your load. We got big goals. We're a little bit behind. You got to be here and do your share. We need you. And I promise you, I promise you, that conversation will have 10 times the impact coming from top down. Because nobody wants to let the leader down. Most people don't, but they sure don't want to let their teammates down. So peer to peer. Now you got to give people permission to do that. You got to say, listen, guys, I can't be everywhere and see everything. And a team that grows together cares enough about each other to call each other out. It's okay to call each other out. Call me out. Yeah. Let's be respectful about it. Use the same respect you would want someone to use for you. But we all need to grow. We all need to get better. If somebody's off track, give them that nudge. You know, if somebody's doing what they're not supposed to do, remind them that's not who we are. That's not how we do it here. So you've got to give people permission to do it. Now, a lot of them still won't. I had a guy say, well, I could never get all my guys to do that. Well, let me make it easy for you. You don't need all of them to do it. All you need <laughs> one or two Yeah. that will start to become a little more vocal and become, now you're a player led team not just a coach led team. And that's going to be stronger. It's going to be tighter. So level two is a, that's, we really want to see more level two, but there's a level even better. And I've already alluded to it earlier. It's level one, which is self accountability. Most of us have somebody on our team. You never have to hold accountable. They just do their job. And then some, not because you have to threaten them or beg them or bribe them. It's because that's who they are. Some people, that's just part of their character. That's just who they are. They have a higher standard for themselves than you would ever have for them. That's why they're at level one. Hey, that's cool. That's good. I love that. And some people, they were at the other levels and they got tired of hearing it from other people and they got their act together. That's cool too. That's growth, right? And personally, I don't care how they got there. I just want them to get there. <laughs> yeah. And so the more level one you have, Life starts to get really good when you see in more of that level two and more of that level one, as we got to create those conditions. And so again, usually we're a blend. We've got, we've got some people we never have to hold accountable at level one. We got some stuff going on that shouldn't be going on. That's level four. Some stuff the manager addresses, some stuff a teammate addresses. which dominates. Look at your culture. Think about the department you're spending most of your time in. Which is dominant now? And is that okay? Is whatever level is dominating going to get you to where you need to go? Or are you going to need to tighten it up a little bit? And whatever the case is, reinforce what's going well and tighten it up if you're off track. Accountability is a really big deal. And we're seeing less of it now because of all the sensitive uh, people and all the political oh, yeah. correctness and we're so afraid to offend somebody well you will offend them if you're a jerk about it but if you have conversations and you do it in a respectful manner you reduce the chances of that happening and even if they choose to take the offense again you can't control that the fact that they might shouldn't stop you from doing your job well, I mean, several things to pull out of this. The first thing, uh, when you're talking about the, the accountability part, I think you're exactly right. I always tell people, hey, when I'm holding them accountable, you may be upset, but your wife and children or your husband and children are not going to be upset because the things we're doing now are going to pay your bills. They're going to, you know, they're going to pay for an education long term. We're going to pay for your retirement. Um, and you know, th that's a fine line too. But it's it's what you it's how you say it now, what you say it. The other thing that's popping into my head, and, and this is going to lead me to my next question, is when you talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, is uh, one of the best books I've read in a long time is John Maxwell's book, 360-Degree Leader. I love that book because he just talks about that. We all we can all lead from different angles and different leads. You can lead up, down, left, right, but we're all a leader within ourselves. The question that really leads me with John Maxwell is, 
when I think about mentorship and who I look up to, there's several people I look up to you. I consider you a personal mentor of mine. I mean, I've, I listen to damn near all your podcasts and, and I get so much out of it. That's why I love having you on the show. It means a lot to me. Um, but who do you look up to? Because, you know, we all look up to somebody. We have to look up to somebody. Uh, who do you look up to? You know, it's interesting. It's a great question. I We have a training center here that's part of our corporate offices. We have about 5,000 square feet of office space and we have 5,000 square feet of a training center and I call it our elite center. And I actually have a mentor's wall there. And uh, on that mentor's wall, I have pictures of me with three of my different mentors over the years, and they've all impacted me in different ways. And, you know, I encourage everybody, you know, think about whose wall you would be on and who you should have on your wall. And so John Maxwell is one of the people on my mentor's wall, and he still impacts me today. I met John back in the 90s, and he's really mentored me on leadership. I was a good manager when I started reading John Maxwell books. I wasn't a good leader, and those two are very different Mm, things. And I really learned a ton about leadership. I became close to John. We became friends back then. I was actually on his board for a period of time. I left it to, to spend more time on our own foundation's board. But he is someone that continues to impact me with his thoughts on leadership motivation i was now he's he's since deceased but a huge influencer for me and mentor for me on motivation attitude focusing on what you can control is zig ziglar he's on my mentor as well john actually introduced me to zig back in the late 90s and zig helped me get my first book published i was a, an unknown author nobody really cares that much about you when you haven't published anything and he he helped me and we stayed in touch we became friends and uh, I was I was with him shortly before he passed away. First self help book I ever read was See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. It's still when I read read my notes and my highlights, which I go through from time to time, still full of gold. His was on motivation, controlling your attitude. Attitude is a choice. You can't choose what happens to you. You get to choose how you respond to it. Why should anybody else have to motivate you? You should have enough fire within to get yourself going. All these things, huge impact there. So John was leadership, still impacts me there. Zig, even though he's not here anymore, his works still impact me there on on, uh, attitude and motivation. And then mindset. I mean, the last two books I've written, Unstoppable and then Intentional Mindset, which will come out soon, uh, I was mentored by, by my sensei in the martial arts. I got in, I'm 59 now, Jeremy. I got into the martial arts in my 40s. I started doing uh, mission trips in dangerous parts of the world, and I wanted to know how to take care of myself. And so I picked a great guy. He's a seven time world champion. He's in three karate halls of fame. He's a ninth degree black belt. And he's the one that taught me so much about getting your thinking right. Martial arts, it's a lot about mindset. I learned about the red belt mindset, how to stay hungry from him. Uh, how, how to let pain empower you, right? How not, how not to get distracted by it, whether it's emotional or whether it's physical, uh, how to cause things to happen for you, not to you. And, and, and so those three guys today, and my sensei still today, they continue to impact me. There are other books I read that have a nice influence on me. Simon Sinek is a great influence on me. Uh, Andy Stanley, who's a pastor, also a writer speaker, is a great influence on me. I listen to a lot of biblically based podcasts on the way to work and back uh, because that has a lot that, that has a huge influence on my leadership principles and how I think. But those three uh, are, are the biggest for having gotten me to where I'm at and continuing to influence me with their work and their words. Um, well, like I said, my friend, I, 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 one of these days I'm gonna get a picture with you and, and that's going on the, that's going on the wall of fame for sure. My friend, cause like I said, from day one, the first video I ever saw of you was with you interviewing Zig and uh-huh. that video just, uh, I've watched it. I bet I've watched it 30 times, at least 30 times. And it, Seen that, I love it. Awesome. A lot of people don't know that he fell down a flight of stairs, Jeremy, uh, and he had a severe brain injury and he had severe short term memory loss. Uh, He could um, he he, he, you could have a you could have an intelligent conversation with him, but he wouldn't remember what he said two minutes ago. Mm. And so I went down there to Dallas to do an interview with him after that time. And he, he did very, very well, but he changed his speaking circuit to where his daughter was interviewing him 
on stage and drawing the wisdom out of him more than him giving the speech. So even with a brain injury, yeah. he continued uh, at a frantic pace to to inspire and help educate other people. So it's uh, in that that video that you saw him. That was the last time I was with him. And uh, it was a it was an interview we did together in his studio at his headquarters down in Plano, Texas. And it's a very, very special time for me to remember. I'm glad that you were able to see that many times. Oh, man. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, my friend, obviously, it's Christmas time. And I know Christmas, uh, you know, I hear in, in several languages, for Feliz Navidad, everybody speaking uh, Spanish, uh, I think in Hawaii. But I'm just curious, uh, do you have any idea how to say Merry Christmas in Russian? <laughs> I you know, I can say, I can actually say a few things in Russian. I, w one of the places that I was doing uh, mission trips was to Russia. And I always had a, an ability to pick up languages, uh, just even since high school. I never really got great at any of them, but they came quickly to me. So I learned how to read the Russian language and I learned how to say some things to get through customs and so forth because I heard they weren't very helpful over there if you were English <laughs> or, or American. So I can say a lot of things in Russian. I can't say Merry Christmas. I can say I can say this to you. So there's a lot of different things I can say, but uh, never really got into the Christmas spirit while I was there. I wasn't really there at that time of the year to learn how to say that. I can say which is God bless you if you sneeze. I can toast you and say nozdorovye, which is uh, they toast with a lot of vodka over there. So I had to learn how to say that. Oh, yeah. But the not Merry Christmas. Well, I heard a little birdie told me that. And I had to, I'm going to make sure I got that out today, which is fantastic. Knows that. That's funny. That was a long <laughs> time ago. Uh, that's great. Uh, Dave, uh, obviously, uh, we're, tell everybody where they can find you. Learn to lead .com is our is our website. Learn to lead .com. Spell it out just like it sounds. We've got a resource there. It's all free. It's called the Insider Club, and we have videos. We have our most listened to podcast episodes there. Uh, there are articles. It's like a command central uh, for personal growth. So you can learn uh, a lot there and feast on that information. Make sure you check out the podcast too. Um, the Game Changer Live by far. It's, it's one of those every Friday morning I listen to that one, but I get jacked up. I mean, literally, it's, it's one of those I, I, if I miss a couple episodes – I, put, I just put on that. I'd listen to all of them, you know, three, four, five in a row. They're not very long, which I love. They're 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes they get a little bit longer, but uh, I love them and I'm a big fan. So uh, again, from the bottom of my heart, uh, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. One of these days I'm going to get out there. We're going to hang out. Um, I can't wait. It's going to happen, my friend. Open invitation. Come out. Let me show you. A, let me give you a tour of our elite center. We have some really cool stuff here and we'd love to have you out here. And thank you for the been many kind words and for having Absolutely. me back on your show, Jeremy. Keep up the great work. I appreciate it, my friend. Uh, like everyone listening around the world, I, um, it means more to me uh, than you know that you're listening, taking time. And, and, and like I tell everybody, hey, share these episodes, share them with people you love. And, and share this episode, share them with anybody. It's not just, we talk about a lot of stuff in leadership and business, but this kid, you can put this in family settings, on uh, a basketball, like you said, basketball team. Uh, but you can share this message anywhere and, and it applies in a lot of different areas in life. So, uh, from bottom of my heart, I appreciate you uh, listening, appreciate you watching, and like always, uh, you've got greatness within. This is the positive side. Uh, let's